Five borderline traits that destroy romantic relationships. Hi, this is Mike, and this is the One Thing That Heals BPD and NPD Abuse channel. And in this video, we're going to talk about five traits that you most likely are not aware of that are associated with your borderline girlfriend, boyfriend, husband, wife, whatever. And that's what this, this channel is about. This channel is specifically designed to help people who have been in romantic relationships or are currently in romantic relationships with people who suffer from uh, untreated, undiagnosed, and or toxic borderline personality disorder. And if you have been in a relationship with somebody like that, there's a good chance that you're still in a huge amount of pain, you're still confused, you're still focused on them, you have difficulty trusting other people, you can't seem to just get your life going. It's, uh, it's something that once it gets inside of you, it, it never really goes away. Unless you do the one thing that I suggest that people do, and you can find out about that in my book, How I Survived My Borderline Girlfriend, which you can find on Amazon, Kindle, and Audible, you can go to audiobooks.thunderwizard.com to see all of my audiobooks. So, what are these five borderline traits that destroy relationships? I'm going to go into each one of those. These, of course, aren't the only five, but they are extremely important for people who are in, in relationships. See, here's the thing. You're in a relationship with somebody, and you think you know what's going on with them. You think you understand that what you're dealing with is a very sensitive individual like, you know, this beautiful little blue-eyed borderline here. She's very sensitive. She has been through tremendous trauma. She's afraid. You know, when you get close to her, she gets frightened and she acts destructively. She tells you, I just need to know that I can trust you. You just have to be patient with me. You say to yourself, if, if I just show her that I'm stable and solid and dependable, if I just don't let her push me away or destroy me, eventually she will catch on that she's safe and she'll love me. And then she'll go back to being that amazing little sex kitten that she was those first few weeks when you got together that she hasn't gotten back to. She'll stop doing all those horrible things to you because she just needs to understand, you know, that you love her and it's okay. This is uh, based on a bunch of wrong assumptions about her. And I'm here to tell you, even if you've been with your borderline 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, if you still think there's hope that someday she will let go, if every time that she gets closer to you, you know, what happens is she will split from you, and then she will come back and then she will bring you closer to her. Each time that happens, you get hope. You go, well, see now this time I was closer than last time and I almost had it. I almost had her convinced and then she split on me again. Next time, next time. And so you have hope that next time she will actually figure it out. And this is based on a completely wrong assumption about her. You think that she remembers all of the love that you give her. You think that she understands what's going on with her and that she's making progress. So in order to understand that there really isn't any hope, and let me just be clear, the there are borderlines who can get into a state of recovery. They can never be cured from this, but they can get into a state of recovery and that state of recovery will only happen after at least eight years of intense therapy. And it has to be the right therapy and they have to want it. And usually it's therapy combined with group therapy, combined with daily exercises um, in order for them to learn how to manage their symptoms. That's the best you're gonna get. But I'm pretty sure that if you're watching this channel, that's not what's going on with you. So that's what this channel is for. For people who are in these kinds of relationships, if you've are if you got a great relationship with your borderline, don't send me nasty emails. Um, you know, this channel isn't for you. This is only for people who 
recognize that there is something broken within them as a result of being in these relationships and you want some help. So let's get right into it. What are the five traits? And if you understand what these five traits are and you accept them, you'll be that much closer to being able to do the one thing that I suggest, which by the way, will completely cure you of your pain from that relationship. All right, let's get into what these five things are. So five borderline traits that destroy relationships. Psychosis, absence of identity, dissociation, confabulation, and secondary psychopathy. Again, these are not, this is not an exhaustive list of all the things. I'm not here to, to diagnose what goes on, uh, everything inside the borderline. I'm here to tell you the things that you don't know that are going on. You think you know what's going on with her and you're completely wrong, which is why you keep coming back and why you keep getting your heart smashed to bits. So the first one is psychosis. We've talked about this on the channel a little bit, but it bears repeating. If you are in a relationship with a borderline or if you have been in a relationship with a borderline and you're still suffering from the effects, you are neurotic. So what's the difference between psychosis and neurosis? Psychosis is when there really is a disconnect between you and objective reality. Psychosis is when your internal self-defense mechanism fantasy, it's a fantasy created out of a desperate need to protect yourself from objective reality because it is so painful, it feels like it's going to kill you. So you create a fantasy within you in order to survive it. And when that fantasy, that protection fantasy becomes as real or more real to you than objective reality, you are in a state of psychosis. Your borderline is in a state of psychosis. If she wasn't, she wouldn't be a borderline, period. End of story. Sorry. If you're a borderline and you come on here and you tell me you're not psychotic, I'm going to say good for you. Then you're not a borderline. So a borderline is in a state of psychosis. They, you know, again, what the borderline does as opposed to the narcissist, the borderline has this, this psychotic fantasy, but the borderline pastes their psychotic fantasy onto external reality. You come walking through onto the stage, they then share their fantasy with you. You then choose to become an actor. You put on the costume and you go through the script and you become the regulator who regulates her emotions so that she can function. It doesn't work, of course, because it's a psychotic fantasy. She doesn't have any empathy for you. You are only a stick figure that she projects all kinds of squishy feelings onto. So borderlines will say, I'm not a narcissist because I have empathy. I feel love. Except for the fact that the love that they feel is actually a projection. It's not coming from anything that you did or anything that you are. You are playing a role. They have these feelings within them. They're waiting to take all of these intense, squishy, lovey feelings that infants have, and they're looking for somebody that they can basically splurt them onto. And you, you volunteer to be that. You conflate that. You think that their squishy feelings and their love uh, in their idealization phase mean something. And so you think they love you. And they don't. So that's the, one of the first mistakes you make. And you hold on to that misunderstanding throughout the whole relationship. That this, what, she really loves me. She really does know I'm the one. No, she doesn't. She is in a state of psychosis. She believes that uh, her fantasy is more real than actual reality. I mean, you know, you've been there. You will recount events that have, you know, when she says you did this and you said that, and you go, that's not at all what I said. And you'll, you'll say, and you'll, or you'll come up to her and you say, well, you remember when you said this? And she'll go, I never said that. That was somebody else. That's because her understanding of reality is not the same as yours. So just on a basic understanding level, She's in a state of psychosis. The thing about that is, is that you can't have a rational conversation with somebody who's a psychotic. You can't, you know, to have a rational conversation means that you agree about, you know, basic fundamental assumptions. We agree on gravity. We agree on, you know, which side of the street you're supposed to drive on. We agree on what day of the week it is. You have to have basic, you know, rational understandings in order to then have a conversation on top of that. 
If your borderline is in a completely different universe and A equals C and 2 plus 2 equals 7, then when you think you're having a rational conversation with them and they nod their head and they say yes, you think they understood and they didn't. Conversely, they're telling you something that's coming from their completely different reality, and you nod your head and you say yes, and they think you understand. So you're both just completely missing each other, fundamentally. So the difference between psychosis and, neur and neurosis is psychosis is you have a definite disconnect with objective reality and or your internal fantasy becomes as real or more real than uh, you know, real reality, and you can't tell the difference. Neurosis. Now, if you're in a relationship with a borderline, by definition, you are a neurotic. You have to be neurotic to stay in the relationship because once you are presented with their incredibly irrational, abusive behavior, first time they split on you, cheat on you, whatever it is that they do, uh, that is, you know, becomes really hurtful and would normally be intolerable, you have to be neurotic because if you weren't neurotic, you would go, well, this isn't going to work. I'm out of here. But because you say, no, there's hope, she really loves me, she's just in pain, she's just afraid, if I show her that she can, uh, that she can trust me, she'll turn around, that is an assumption. And that is a neurosis, a neurosis. A neur neurosis is, you know what objective reality is, but you don't want to accept it. This is what creates cognitive dissonance. Cognitive dissonance is a great word, and it, it really means uh, a form of confusion that is actually um, a sign of extreme PTSD. So there's normal confusion, like, hmm, I'm confused about this, and what is that? And then you're, when you're in a state of trauma, where you're trying to survive, and you're in a deep state of a traumatic, desperately searching to survive, and you're confused, you have two things that don't make any sense. She just cheated on you with your asshole cousin who lives in Vegas and she slashed your tires and stole money from you. But inside of you, you say, but she really does love me. She doesn't understand what she's doing. She will change her mind. It's really going to be okay. And you start to tell yourself this totally irrational fantasy. But there's a the fundamental part of you knows that this isn't working. Why am I still staying in it? Why am I staying with somebody that's destroying me? She's not asking herself those questions. You're asking yourself questions like, why am I staying with, why can't I leave? Why am I still in love with her? You're in a state of cognitive dissonance and it is what neurosis is. Neurosis knows what objective reality is, but really doesn't like it and tries to fight against it unsuccessfully. The difference between the neurotic and the psychotic is the psychotic actually wins the battle against objective reality and is able to convince themselves that their psychotic fantasies are real. You're a neurotic. You can't do that. You try every day. No, she loves me. No, it's going to be okay. Then why do I feel so crappy inside? Why does she do that to me? Well, I, 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 um, this is called cognitive dissonance and it's a form of neurosis. So you basically act like you have a personality disorder, but there's a part of you that knows that, that something's really off and you can't stop yourself. It's horrible. So uh, that's the first thing uh, that if you understand that, whoops, if you understand that borderlines are in a state of psychosis, which means they are not functioning on, in objective reality, then that will help you to separate. The whole point of this is to get you to have the ability so you can separate, so you can get rid of the, the neurotic obsession that it's going to be okay, that it's, that it's workable. When you can let go of that and realize it's never going to work, um, then you'll have more ability to then do the one thing I suggest and completely heal. So, psychosis is the first one. The second one is absence of identity. So that doesn't sound like much, but it's actually everything. Because if you don't have an identity, you can't function. If, you know, and for borderlines, there is a, there is a spectrum. And some borderlines are completely incapable of functioning at all. Some of them can't hold down a job, can't go to school. You know, um, some of them can't. Some of them 
are very able to go to school and become very, uh, you know, very successful. They can hold down jobs. But what every single borderline is incapable of doing is being able to have an intimate romantic relationship. Now, if you're a borderline and you tell me that you are able to have um, successful relationships, then either you're not a borderline or you've been in therapy for 10 years. Because if you are able to have a successful relationship, then by definition, you're not a borderline. Borderline personality disorder becomes the most explosively destructive in romantic relationships. It, they can be explosively destructive in, all, in a bunch of other relationships. But some of them can function, you know, friendships, work relationships. But when it comes to romance, real intimacy, the intimacy that mimics and uh, represents the intimacy that you shared as an infant with your mother, uh, those, that kind of intimacy is where BPD goes bonkers. So, um, so you have to have an identity in order to have a relationship because in order to have a relationship you have to know who you are and uh, you have to know who the other person is but borderlines don't have an identity and that is part of the the mental illness as infants they never were able to create even a, a you know a, a warped identity now, if you're severely codependent, but you don't have a personality disorder, so meaning you could be really sick, you could have real serious emotional, mental, physical problems, you may have, you may only date borderlines and narcissists, you may be incapable of any kind of uh, normal relationship, but if you don't have a personality disorder, then what that means is that you do have some identity. So in order to be the codependent for a borderline or a narcissist, you have to hold the ground. You have, you have to be the one that, that anchors the relationship. And the borderline actually wants you to do that. They want you to anchor them. That's, you know, the whole, when they say borderlines want you to regulate their emotions. It's more than just making them feel okay. It means you actually have to, you are the one who carries the identity for both parties. Since the borderline doesn't have an identity, she will begin to erode your identity slowly bit by bit until it's completely gone. When that happens, she will discard you. But she will do all kinds of things up until that point, And it's because you have an identity. So even though you're severely codependent, in some cases, you still have an identity, which means you wake up the next day, you know who you are, you have a set of standards that you live by. You know, people say, I, you know, when people are asked to do things like lie or cheat or steal, and if they say things like, I just can't live with myself if I do that, I wouldn't be able to look myself in the mirror. It means that they have an identity, and their identity is their survival. And if they act contrary to that, it's, you know, this, there are people that kill themselves over this. If they end up, you know, going against their own principles, it means that they can't, they've, they've, they've walked away from their identity. Borderlines don't have one. And that's very sad for them. Um, and it's nothing to, you know, you know, part of the reason they do uh, many of the things that they do is because they don't have an identity. And when you don't have an identity, then you don't have, you know, like a Ten Commandments within you. There's nothing in you to regulate your emotions, regulate your behavior, regulate, you know, the, my borderline girlfriend would change her religion based on who she was around. She would change her beliefs depending on who she was with. So that means that she has no identity in and of herself. So if she has no identity, she can't commit. Here's the, the thing. You're waiting for her to commit to you. You're waiting for her to get to the point where she goes, okay, I realize that you really do love me. You've put up with all of this. You haven't abandoned me. You never hurt me. I realize that you love me. I'm going to commit myself to you. In order to do that, she has to have an identity. But the fact is, because she doesn't have an identity, the moment you leave the room, you disappear. 
in order for her to remember you as an individual, she has to have an identity of her own. So no matter how much she loves you in the moment, if you're with her and she, you can look in her eyes and her beautiful blue-green eyes are moistening with tears because she's filled with all of these squishy feelings for you, and you feel that, you know she's not lying. She's telling you the truth. I love you. You're the most important person to me. I want to be with you forever. I would never do anything to hurt you. And you say, I'm going to go get some milk at the store. And she says, okay, I'll be here when you get back. Hurry, I already miss you. The moment the door slams, you literally disappear. It's called lack of object constancy. And part of the reason for that is because she has no internal constancy. Remember that life for everybody is a projection. If you have solidity within yourself, you accept other people as existing even when they're not in front of you. Because you know when you leave her, you still exist. Just because you left the room doesn't mean you stop existing. Well, guess what? She stops existing the moment you leave the room. She doesn't know who the hell she is anymore. She based who she was because you were there. You were in the room and she grounded herself in you. You leave the room, she has she's like an infant just just you know with nobody there to to ground her or regulate her and so uh it's a projection you have an identity so you wrongly project onto her that she remembers you when you leave the room that she understands what you say that she remembers what she did yesterday Yesterday, she said to you, you know what? I've made the decision. I'm never going to cheat on you again because I've realized it's wrong and you're my best friend and, you're, and you wake up the next morning and you, because you have an identity, you remember who you were, you remember what happened, you identify with that moment because you identified with yourself. She doesn't have an identity, which means that she doesn't have any, she doesn't, there's no, no root in it. So the moment you leave the room, whatever convictions she had disappear. It's the same, you're, you're sleeping next to her, you know, you pillow talk, I love you. And she says, I love you. And you both fall asleep. She wakes up the next morning and her hard drive has been wiped clean. She looks at you and she doesn't know who you are. She has maybe a vague memory that somebody that looked like her spent the night with you. And so she may have like, like she watched a movie and you were in it. But have you ever been like with them and they look at you like they don't know who you are? You know, you, you've talked to them one day and then you talk to them the next day and they look at you like they don't know who you are because they don't know who you are. They don't know who you are because they don't know who they are. They don't have an identity. If she can't, if she doesn't have an identity and she isn't deeply into therapy working on this, she can't ever be what you want. So that's number two, absence of identity. Third, the third one is dissociation. So we're sort of, you can see how these are connected. So dissociation, you know, um, people, you know, I, I have, anyway, um, I run into people lots of times who don't know what dissociation means. I suppose there's different levels of dissociation. So, you know, if we wanted to, you know, uh, make up a term, you know, normal dissociation. That could be somebody who's in a lot of pain and so they watch television, they have a beer, they, uh, you know, um, do drugs, they smoke a joint. They want to disconnect from the pain. They want to stuff the pain down. That is a form of dissociating. But it's never full, fully dissociated. You're never fully dissociated. You know that it's there. You, you know, it's going to be there in a few hours or when you wake up the next day, it's going to be there. You're going to deal with it. When we're talking about the dissociation of a borderline, we're talking about completely dissociating. So, for instance, borderlines cannot tolerate intense feelings. Now, here's something you didn't understand. You can understand that they can't tolerate painful feelings. We all get that. Nobody likes that. But what you don't understand is they can't tolerate blissful feelings either. So when they feel intense love for you, even if normally it would make you feel full of bliss, because of everything we mentioned and other things, 
when she feels love for you, it is so intense, it is unbearable. And so she dissociates from it. She dissociates from it in a lot of ways. One of the ways is she acts out aggressively towards you. She sabotages the relationship. She does mean things. She cheats on you. She you know, splits on you. Those are all forms of dissociating from an intense emotion. You're supposed to regulate her feelings, but when you become the source of her dysregulation, she has to dissociate from you. So, um, but, you know, for instance, my, my borderline ex, you know, I found uh, out this about her because she told me. My borderline girlfriend, when we'd make love, she would just be an absolute monster. And it was obvious she was, re I mean, I won't get into details, but she was really enjoying it. Like I'd never seen anybody enjoy sex that much in my life, which of course made me, you know, crazy. Like, oh my God, I've hit the jackpot. And then literally like five minutes after washing up, not, not even five minutes, might even be, you know, 30 seconds or a minute after washing up, she'd say, yeah, you know, I really don't like sex that much. What? Do you remember that you did this and you said that? She goes, oh yeah, I guess I did. Uh, she says, but what happens to me is that this sort of mist comes over me and I go somewhere else. She was dead serious. So the person that's there with you, with the intense feelings, the intense love, the intense sexual orgasmic bliss, is not the real person. It is a facade. It is, it's not that it's not real, it's just it's not connected to her because she doesn't have an identity. It, that person that when she's looking at you, you know, with lust or with deep love or with whatever it is that, that she's feeling in that moment, you think, I've done it, I've reached her. No, she is gone, she is somewhere else. And I mean that as literally as, as I possibly can. She will go into a fantasy world, it's, you know, potentially. And in her fantasy world, she's doing the dishes. So it, now you understand psychosis. We're talking about mental illness here. So it is not impossible. It might not happen every time, but it is not impossible for you to say, yeah, you remember yesterday afternoon when we were having sex and she was saying, what are you talking about? Yesterday afternoon, I was doing the dishes all day. I didn't even see you yesterday. She'll be dead serious. And you'll be like, what are you talking about? You can even pull up a video and go, look, here's a video. And she's go, oh, that's not me. I didn't do that. Um, this happens with serial killers. So serial killers, you know, dissociate as well. And, um, you know, they have multiple personalities and et cetera, et cetera. And I'm not going to get into that. But, you know, some of them are very clear. You go to them and you say, you know, you did this. And they'll say, that wasn't me. You don't understand. That wasn't me. What they mean is that it was them, but they dissociated in that moment because the, the rage they were feeling was so overwhelming that they didn't identify with it. So that afterwards they would go, well, who was that? I, I, you know, some other guy did that. He looked like me, he talked like me, but it wasn't me. Borderline girlfriend, when she's madly in love with you, when she's having crazy, blissful, orgasmic sex with you, when she's, you know, whatever it is, it could be anything. Um, if, if the feeling is too overwhelming, she goes away. Uh, and she was never there with you. She dissociates. So you are rational, meaning that you're not psychotic, you're neurotic, but you are rational. And you are making a list. You are rationally writing down all of the things that she said and she did and all of the things that would... Uh, be evidence to a rational person. And you would be able to go to a rational person and say, no, remember when you said this, remember when you said that, and a rational person will say, you're right, I did say that, and you're right. And, and so I'll, I'll work on that. And, and, or they would wake up the next day and they would go, you know, I proposed marriage to her yesterday. I'm having doubts about it now, but you know what? I, I made a commitment and I was really feeling a lot of love, and so um, I'm just going to stick with it. She can't do that because one of the reasons is because she dissociates. So you think you know who you're with, and I guarantee you, you don't. M much of the time, 
I mean, because, you know, when they're dissociating and they have a facade, the a facade is a fully functioning, you know, it's not really a personality, but it's like a personality. It's a fully functioning part of them that, that initiates, that, that communicates, that interacts, and it's a defense mechanism because they can't function. So there's this sort of AI actor that comes up and, and acts as though I'm a real person and says all the right things and does all the right things and has emotions and portrays emotions, but your borderline isn't there and she won't remember it tomorrow or she will misremember it and you won't be able to do anything to change that because she's psychotic. She's not neurotic like you. A neurotic person like you, I can sit down with you and I can talk you into rationality because there's a part of you that's still rational. And if you're interested in knowing the truth, I could talk you back into some rational uh, understanding. The borderline doesn't have that. They may even say that they get it, but the moment you leave the room, it's all gone because they dissociate. Confabulation. All right, so you have a long laundry list of all of the lies that she says. You guys had an argument yesterday, and you remember exactly what was said, and you might have even recorded exactly what was said because you've been here before. But when she comes back to you and talks about the, the conversation, according to her, you grew two horns out of your head and uh, you jumped up on a table and you pulled out a dagger and you started then, then shooting blow darts into her after you tied her to the ground and offered her soul to the devil. And you're like, I have no idea what you're talking about. The only thing that happened was is that I was upset because you had dinged the side of my car when you went to the store. She says, no, that's not what happened at all. What happened is you walked in the door then you grew two devil's wings and the horns came out and you started screaming at me and fire was coming out of you. Your eyes grew twice the size into your head and she's dead serious. Or it could be something else like, like uh, if she cheated on you. She, you know, you guys had the best lovemaking of your life. You woke up the next day, she was gone and you got a text from your asshole cousin and says, ah, your ex-girlfriend's fucking me right now. And then she comes back and says, you don't understand. The devil came to me and um, I couldn't, I had to do it. You don't understand. He came and grabbed me by the throat and pulled me out the window. And, you know, they will come up with these, these absolutely unbelievable justifications and stories. And your first response, because you think she's rational, because you don't even understand the first three, you don't understand she's psychotic, you don't understand that she doesn't have an identity, and you don't understand that she dissociates, you think that she has to be lying. She's obviously lying. She's obviously choosing to lie to you. And that's a very understandable conclusion because you have the misunderstanding, you have the wrong assumption. You think she's rational. You think she's like you are. Because if you were to say something like that, it would just be the most unbelievable, outrageous lie that exists. But if you don't have an identity, if you're psychotic and you dissociate and you live in a fantasy world and your fantasy world is more real than objective reality, you can pick and choose. And they choose a reality that meets their feelings. Let me repeat myself. They choose a reality for themselves that meets and justifies their feelings. So, yes, you're right. She woke up in the middle of the night. She had a nightmare because the intense intimacy between the two of you was so frightening in her nightmare you were choking her to death she can't tell the difference between her dreams and objective reality so she sneaks out and goes running off to your asshole cousin's house in vegas and sleeps with him and tells him how horrible you were to him and all you did was offer to marry her and um then she tells herself what she tells herself is a story that actually meets her emotional needs. 
So in order to justify getting up in the middle of the night, getting in your car, driving to Vegas, fucking your, your cousin, your, your meth addict cousin, in order to justify it, she has to come up with a story that actually justifies the intensity of her feelings. So bear in mind, she's psychotic, she doesn't have an identity, she dissociates. So she has to come up with a reality that meets her feelings, otherwise she feels crazy. She doesn't wanna feel crazy. So if she's given an option between, here's the objective reality, the objective truth is, is that all that your boyfriend did was treat you with love and he offered to marry you and you got scared, you had a nightmare, you woke up in the middle of the night and you left because you couldn't tolerate the thought of being with them. After the fact, because you dissociate, once she gets in the car and drives away and you're no longer there, she starts to come up with a reality that makes sense to her because there's a part of her that knows that what I just did doesn't make any sense. So in order for her to survive that, she comes up with a story. You started growing three eyeballs. You started farting out gremlins that were chewing on her toes. You don't understand. I had to leave. I had to leave. It wasn't my fault. The devil was coming for me. She won't know the difference between that. Just to, again, giving, giving you another example in, in my, my brief experience with my borderline ex, I've shared this story before, but we were out to dinner. We were going from one place to the next because there was always something wrong. It was too loud, it was too bright. What was happening was is that the intimacy was getting too much because she had come to where I live and she was gonna spend the weekend with me and it was the intimacy was getting too, fr it was getting too real. I, I know that in hindsight now, I didn't know that then. And so in the, in the middle of waiting for our food to come, when she finally uh, decided to stay in one restaurant, she, uh, I don't remember what it was, but she said something that was really outrageously inappropriate and strange. And um, I didn't say anything. I didn't know how to respond. So she said something really, I mean, I, again, I can't remember what it was, but it was just really outrageous. And um, I just sat there and I internally, I thought to myself, I have no idea what that means, but I'm not going to react because I don't want her to flip out. And I stood there and, and I sat there and this went on for probably five or 10 seconds, five or 10 seconds of me looking at her, trying to figure out how I can, you know, steer this conversation back someplace safe. She then looks at me and says, don't look at me like that, and gets up and walks away. Later on, I asked her, what did you think I did? You said, don't look at me like that. She said, you, you sat there and your eyes got huge and you bent over and you looked at me like you were gonna kill me. And, and I said, how long did that happen? She said, that went on for about 30 seconds. I said, that never happened. I was there. I know exactly what, what I was feeling. I know exactly what was going on. It was probably about five seconds and I was just simply looking for an appropriate, you know, helpful response. None of what you said was accurate in the slightest. So she had a feeling and her feeling was that she was, of course, very insecure, felt all kinds of shame, fear, uh, insecurity, what else, whatever else. And so she confabulated, she created a reality that fit her feelings, but was not at all connected to objective reality. And that's just a slight, uh, uh, you know, example. All right, so what's next? Uh, confabulation. So confabulation, the point about confabulation is they don't lie all the time. Don't get me wrong. Some of them do, and sometimes they do willingly and knowingly lie. But much of the time, they're not lying, they're confabulating. They're creating a fable. You know, a fable is a, you know, a story. They create an unbelievable story. The word fabulous doesn't mean good. It means unbelievable, like fabuloso, you know, connecting, you know, it, it's like a fable. It's like a fairy tale. It's crazy. It's, it's, totally, it's totally unbelievable. It's science fiction. 
we could instead of saying fabulous we could say science 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 fictionist it's just just beyond the scope of reality so she creates a fable within herself she creates a story that has to rise to the level that meets her feelings her feelings are what's inaccurate her feelings are not at all in context with what is objectively happening. Completely, totally blown way out of proportion. So the story that she tells herself has to also be blown to that level of disproportionality so that she can justify to herself why she just did this crazy thing like scream at me and get up and walk out of the... Uh, walk out of the... Uh, restaurant or when she gets up in the middle of the night slashes your tires and goes and has sex with your asshole meth addict cousin in Vegas and that's all you did was uh, you know offer to marry her the night before she has to come up with something she has to create a fable and the point of this again you want you want to tell me that she's lying to you because you want to believe that she's rational and this is important so those of you who are angry you're full of rage and you want to tell me why they choose to do these things. They can choose to do them but, uh, and not do them, but they do them anyway because they're evil. They chose to lie to you from the beginning. They chose to deceive you. They chose to do all those things just to get off on watching you be in pain. Um, you are only got part of the story. We'll talk about that in the next one, but... Um, you tell yourself that she's choosing to lie to you because if you can convince yourself that she's rational, it means that she will love you, that there's hope. If you accept the fact that she is in fact mentally ill, she is psychotic, she is not at all connected to the same reality that you are, and the majority of the things that she says and does are not at all what you think they are, and that there's there's no way you're ever going to communicate with her on a way where you'll have a functional relationship, then you'll you'll give up on the hope of her ever loving you. And again, the real reason why you want her to love you is because she reminds you of your mom. And for whatever reason, your mom didn't love you, or you don't feel that she loved you, and that's an intolerable pain. So you're recreating the scenario of trying to get an irrational um, psychotic, narcissistic, emotionally unavailable person. You're trying to get them to love you because if you can get your borderline to love you, it'll mean that your mom will love you. And so that's why you hold on to the delusion that she's doing it on purpose. She's lying to me on purpose. She could do things differently if she wanted to. But you're not understanding that she has a mental illness and you don't understand all these things about her because if you do, you'll die inside. The thought of not being loved by this person is unacceptable to you. So the only other possibility is that she's doing it on purpose. Now you know different. Number five, secondary psychopathy. So psychopathy, let me just, let me just correct some misinformation out there. Psychopathy does not mean yelling at the top of your lungs. Psychopathy is not equated with uh, um, antisocial personality disorder. They're not the exact same thing. Psychopathy is this. Psychopathy is when you take pleasure in other people's pain. Now, you don't have to yell at somebody to do that. You don't have to scream. You can be very rational and normal. You can have a smile on your face. You can be passive aggressive. You can, um, you know, you can be very, seem very rational and normal. You can be screaming your head off. You can be throwing knives at somebody. You can be physically abusing them. Or you can just simply be destroying them. You can simply be devaluing them or discarding them. If you take pleasure in discarding somebody and you take pleasure in their pain or you get some kind of feeling of power from it, maybe instead of saying pleasure. You know, the thing when borderlines split, one of the reasons they split is because it gives them a sense of power. And so to be in a position where you feel empowered 
by disempowering somebody else, that is psychopathic. It doesn't mean that you're yelling and screaming. So the borderline, by definition, is a secondary psychopath. Secondary means, you could also say covert psychopath, which means that it's hidden. And it's hidden even to the borderline. Oh, sorry. Even the borderline doesn't know that they are psychopath. So borderline personality disorder is as close as you can get to dissociative identity disorder, which is multiple personalities. Instead of multiple personalities, borderlines have facades, which are almost the same thing as alternate personalities, uh, except that they remember sometimes. Um, but the other thing is, is that they have at least two functional personalities within them. They have the vulnerable, cute, loving infant within them, which you conflate with the real person. You think the real person is the cute little fuzzy uh, little girl in there. In fact, there's been no shortage of times that people have asked me, so how can I just communicate with the real person and not the psychopath? And I say, you don't understand how this works. The, these two personalities are not real. Neither of them are real. Because as, as I said, she doesn't have an identity. You think she identifies with what you perceive to be the nice part of her, the, the compassionate part of her, the empathic part of her. You think that is who she really is. And of course, she would like to believe that also. And bear in mind, again, if she's in therapy, she might be able to create that identity. But if she, if she isn't in therapy, it's virtually impossible. It's just, it's not going to happen. So you think that the fuzzy, cute, loving, sweet, and don't get me wrong, they're, they're amazing. I mean, my borderline ex was an amazingly wonderful, beautiful person. But she wasn't fully identified with that person. And on the other side of that was uh, a psychopath, just a, a cold, dead-eyed, um, sociopathic psychopath who took pleasure in gaining the power when she would devalue or discard me. So what is the difference between, let's talk about discarding. What's the difference between discarding somebody and breaking up with them? Breaking up with them, you are getting somebody out of your life, you are destroying a relationship, but you're doing it consciously. You've been with them for a certain amount of time and you guys have tried to meet, you know, at a certain level and it's just not happening. You both try, you do your best, you fight, you get together, but there's a rationality to all of it. It's not crazy, irrational, you know, borderline behavior. It's, it may be dysfunctional, there may be emotions, but it's rational. And when you break up, it's understood. Both sides understand. There's one person that's more hurt than the other, but it's understood. You understand why they broke up with you. You may not like it, but you understand it. It's not psychopathic. When the person is breaking up with you, they're doing it. They don't want to hurt you. They may still want to be friends with you afterwards. In fact, you may, may continue to be friends for a while. Uh, maybe you'll be lifelong friends afterwards. You both understand that it's not working out. And even though you'd like to work on it, let's say you're the one that's hurt, you understand that for him or for her, that's just not who they are. And because you care about them, you go, I understand. You know, I don't want to have kids and you do. I've been in that situation before. I'd really love to continue to be with you. I think we'd make great partners, but you're right. I don't want to have kids and so I understand why you're leaving and, and it hurts me, but I want what's best for you. And the other person says, and I want what's best for you. You know, I want to have kids, you don't. And, and so it would be unfair of me to force that on you, right? That's a breakup. That's not a discarding. Discarding is exactly what it sounds like. It's, it's uh, grabbing a piece of trash, crumpling it up and throwing it in the, in the garbage bin or putting it down the garbage disposal. You're discarding somebody like they are a worthless, piece of crap. And that is your mindset. So when the borderline splits, they go psychopathic. Psychopathic means that they are going to do something that is incredibly destructive to you, to the relationship, and they're going to consciously think of you as a horrible piece of garbage. 
or as an incredibly dangerous thing. You know, when, when if you're fighting for your life, if, if a grizzly bear comes out of the woods and you have a shotgun and that grizzly bear, you know, knocks you down to the ground and you go rolling and you pull out your shotgun and you look that grizzly bear in the eye and you pull that trigger and you are choosing, you want the death of that, that, that frightening bear. You're psychopathic in that moment. You have no empathy. You have no um, connection. You don't feel the life force of that being. You don't feel an empathy for that being. In the moment that you pull the trigger, you have to be a psychopath. And you have to do it because if you don't, it'll kill you. You need to overpower that being in order to survive. And that's what goes on in the mind of the borderline when they discard you. Whether they do it screaming and yelling, or whether they do it like mine did, where she'll, you know, after we've had the best, most wonderful pillow talk, and, you know, we love each other, and you're the best, and, and I feel so connected, and I feel so safe, and all of that, and then the next day I get a phone call. So I've been thinking about this all day. I had a bad dream last night, and yesterday you said the word, uh, um, super califragilistic, and I realized that when you said that word, that you were actually very wrong for me. You're uh, you're very destructive to me and um, very unhealthy for me, and I can't have anything to do with you. So I'm letting you know. And then, of course, I have all these things. What are you talking about? Oh my God! Why are you so upset? I, I mean, I thought about it all day. I talked to my friends about it. I don't know why you're getting so upset. Oh my God, you're so dramatic. What do you mean I'm dramatic? Last night, you said you wanted to spend the rest of your life with me. You're tearing me apart. You're, you're blowing my heart to bits. Oh my God, you're so dramatic. I'm blowing your heart to bits. No, it, look, it's this is what I mean. You're just too uh, irrational and emotional for me and I can't be with you and therefore I you can't contact me ever again. Click. That's secondary psychopathy. She did not lose her temper. She did not call me any names. She talked to her friends about it. She wrote it down on a piece of paper. But the whole time it was based on an irrational fear. She had a dream and in the dream she thought that I did something to her. She woke up, had this irrational feeling that I was dangerous to her, that I was seeking to destroy her. And she convinced herself of that. Then she went off because she's a quiet borderline. She went off and said, I'll, yeah, I, I got to go. I'll talk to you tomorrow. All the while knowing she's going to go home and plan the discard. And she does what she needs to do. She confabulates. She talks to her friends, tells her friends that I, you know, spit at her and said supercalifragilistic expialidocious or whatever. And then she writes it out to herself and she, you know, rationally looks at it. And then she comes back and takes pleasure in discarding me, gets power from it. And there's no rationality to it. And in the meanwhile, um, not only did I not deserve it, not only did I not say or think any of those things, not only was that not the case, but I was actually the most loving, supportive person, you know, I can imagine she's ever had in her life. Maybe, maybe not. But she was still psychopathic. So when they split on you, it's psychopathy. That's what secondary psychopath means. The secondary psychopath is that Behind the facade uh, of the vulnerable, loving, empathic little borderline baby that you fell in love with, the little love kitten, right? Behind that, there is the protector because she makes herself so vulnerable so fast, just like an infant. She makes herself so vulnerable so fast and then you respond with love, unless you're a narcissist and that's a whole other scenario, but if you respond with love, you respond with, with connection, you respond with vulnerability, you respond with true empathy and true intimacy, that then triggers in her her fear of abandonment as well as her uh, psych psychopathic or psychotic fear of being destroyed. She doesn't know the difference between being loved and being consumed. So once she becomes aware that you really do love her, she then is filled with this absolute fear of being consumed and destroyed, which triggers a psychopathic 
defensive response. So it's not that, you know, an evil, horrible person. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about somebody who has a completely dysfunctional um, defense mechanism. And it's coming from psychosis. It's coming from a completely disconnected place. It has nothing to do with objective reality. So this is what will happen. And, as, and I've said in other videos, there will come a final discard. At some point, you will no longer, she will, she will slowly erode your ability to have an identity. She will slowly erode your ability to tolerate her nonsense. And when you become so disempowered and when you become a functional uh, borderline, you know, there's, we talked about um, becoming a temporary functional narcissist. You know, which means that you take on the traits of a narcissist even though you don't have a personality disorder. So at some point in this relationship, you will take on the traits of a borderline and you will functionally become a borderline even though you don't have a personality disorder. When that happens, it means that you no longer can access your identity, which is what she needs in order to root herself into you. And in order to regulate herself, she needs your identity to do that. When she's eroded your identity and devalued you to the point where you no longer have one and you become like a needy infant and you need her so badly and you have nothing to give but you have only have need, her response will be to discard you because uh, you will have no value. She will see herself in you. She hates herself more than anything in the universe. She hates herself more than anything. Then she'll, when she looks at you, she will see herself, which means that she will hate you more than anything else in the universe. And she will feel the need to ultimately discard you forever. She will confabulate that you are trying to destroy her, that you are trying to kill her. Or worse yet, she will have provoked you into becoming uh, an abusive, narcissistic, codependent partner, in which case she will then justify to herself how horrible and narcissistic you are even though she was the one that provoked it. So um, the secondary psychopath will eventually come out. And what will happen is the, you know, the, two, the two facades will shift places. In the beginning, she has the cute little fuzzy, uh, needy little infant, the sex kitten, the perfect partner, the perfect romance uh, partner who sees you as a god and then of course that starts to slowly go away and they, there's this dance back and forth between the psychopath and the borderline and then eventually it'll just completely switch places and she will only be able to respond to you from her psychopathy and if you understand that this is this is written in the fabric of reality this cannot be changed then you'll have the ability to leave now this isn't an attack on them, borderlines have a mental illness. They can't help it. If they get into therapy, uh, the right therapy, and for long enough time, they can suppress the symptoms. The internal mechanism won't go away, but they'll be able to suppress the symptoms. But if they're with you, they can never, almost, I can't say never, but it is almost impossible if they're with you that they'll be able to go into therapy and create the shift while you're there because you're a codependent. And you will, you, that's a whole other story. All right, so these are the five borderline traits that um, destroy relationships. Psychosis, absence of identity, dissociation, confabulation, and secondary psychopathy. Point is, is that it's hopeless. Sorry, but there's no hope. And if you've been with a borderline, you have become a functional borderline. She has turned you into a borderline even after she's left. So even though you don't have a personality disorder, you have been interjected. It's, been, it's like a virus program that's been put into you. She's continuing to devalue you and feed off of your energy, even if you guys don't have any contact, especially if you have minimal contact or partial contact, you're never out of this. You are being destroyed uh, on a daily basis and you do it to yourself. And the only way out is to do the one thing. I have completely healed myself from the damage my borderline girlfriend did to me. And you can have the same thing that I have, but in order to have what I have, you have to do what I do. So you can get my book, How I Survived My Borderline Girlfriend, Amazon, Kindle, and Audible. Uh, go to audiobooks.thunderwizard.com or you can put 10 seconds 
into searching my, this channel and you'll find out what the one thing is. If you don't do the one thing uh, and you, let's say, just go to therapy, there's a pretty good chance therapy will never cure you of it. You might have little intermittent bits of seeming awareness, but the truth is you'll probably never stop being uh, attracted to borderlines and narcissists. You may have multiple relationships or you'll end up alone for the rest of your life and incapable of having a relationship. And you'll just be f just continuous, you know, stuck in that trauma pause that I talk about. So do the one thing and you can heal. And if you don't, no skin off of my nose. You're the one that has to suffer, not me. So that's it. i uh, see you guys next time. I wish you all the best. Take care.